So I wanted to make an easy to digest uh, history of punk rock. I never really know where to start with these lineages because I go down rabbit holes and I will follow them to the very end. Um, you could make a case that rock and roll in the 1950s was a predecessor for punk rock. I mean, after all, it was a bunch of uh, rambunctious kids playing loud, raucous music, and what's more punk rock than that? But I think I found a good starting point, so here goes. We start our story with Link Ray. Uh, Link Ray is kind of regarded as the father of like guitar distortion as we know it. Um, he came out with this track in the late 50s called Rumble. Uh, Rumble being um, like a big, a big fight that the rival gangs have, like, like in The Outsiders, they use that word. Um, this song was, um, was actually banned because um, they were afraid that uh, it would incite juvenile delinquency. Uh, it came out in 1958, and it was very ahead of its time. Our next stop would be Surf Rock. Uh, Dick Dale released this cover of an old folk song in 1962. It was fast, it was energetic, and uh, I personally think it breathed new life into rock and roll. It's said that he wanted to simulate the excitement of surfing with this song. Um, it influenced a wave of other surf rock musicians. Uh, the Ventures, the Surfaris, all playing this kind of fast, exciting strain of rock and roll. A year later, in 1963, the Kingsmen released their version of a song called Louie Louie. A lot of music historians will trace the lineage of punk rock back to this song as sort of the ground zero of punk rock. It was kind of sloppy, but in the best possible way, uh, and the lyrics were mumbled. For an icing on the punk rock cake, this song was actually investigated by the FBI um, because the indecipherable lyrics might have been something obscene. Meanwhile, across the pond, uh, the UK was releasing their brand of rock and roll. Uh, a lot of British musicians were doing, you know, loud, fast, distorted covers of American rhythm and blues songs, as well as coming up with some songs of their own, like this song, All Day and All of the Night by the Kinks. It was, um, it was distorted, it was heavy, and it was just a couple chords. A lot of musicians, a lot of music historians will also trace the history of heavy metal because of the heavy distortion uh, to this song. But I think it's also an important milestone in the history of punk rock because it's simple, it's just a couple chords, uh, and it's, it's energetic and aggressive. So, influenced by surf rock and the British invasion was a strain of rock and roll that developed in the 60s in the United States called garage rock. Uh, the song Louie Louie that we heard earlier is an example of it. Uh, rock and roll is pretty accessible. It's easy to play, you don't have to be a virtuoso to play it. So a lot of kids started their own rock bands and um, some of them actually got fairly popular. One of the bands that did not become very popular was the, the Sonics from the Pacific Northwest. Um, but they cannot go unnamed when talking about the history of punk rock. Listen to this. Listen to how aggressive and um, raw it is. Uh, definitely a, a keystone moment in the history of punk rock. So another one of those garage rock bands is Question Mark and the Mysterians. Um, much like many other garage rock bands, they were a one-hit wonder. Uh, with this song, 96 Tears. Uh, sonically, it didn't necessarily do that much to advance the genre, but I wanted to include it in this chronology because it has the distinction of being the first song labeled as punk rock by a journalist at the time. And that was kind of an apt nickname for these garage rock bands. Um, they were just a bunch of snotty-nosed punk kids uh, starting bands. 
So we have arrived at the Velvet Underground. The Velvets are probably the most important band in the development of punk rock, and they helped kickstart the scene in New York that would birth punk rock. So it's 1967, they released their first album, The Velvet Underground and Nico. Joining them on this album was Welsh viola player John Cale and German singer Nico. Not to mention they were managed by pop artist Andy Warhol around the time of the album's production. I think these things kind of gave them artistic credibility in the burgeoning New York scene. They were representatives of the underbelly of society. On their first album, they had a song called Heroin, which is straight up about how good it feels to do heroin. And they have a song about sadomasochism. They have this song, which is just Lou Reed singing about uh, waiting on the street corner for his drug dealer. So the Velvet Underground were so important that I had to represent them twice in this chronology. In 1968, they released their second album, White Light, White Heat. Uh, and I wanted to include it because I think sonically it's a better example of how influential they were on the actual punk rock sound and not just the scene. Uh, this song is a great example of that. Uh, it's called Sister Ray. It's vulgar, it's raw, and it's 17 minutes of a fuzzy distorted guitar playing the same three chords over and over again. So that line was one of the most important moments in the development of punk rock. Um, taking a pause from the New York scene, there was uh, another parallel scene kind of going on in Detroit. Uh, this band, MC5, came out with this song, uh, Kick Out the Jams, and they said, motherfucker, on a major record label, and what's more punk rock than that? Welcome to 1970. So also coming out of Detroit were the Stooges. Uh, they were led by frontman Iggy Pop. And he got that nickname from his old garage rock band, the Iguanas. So he was a veteran garage rocker and he was a super punk rock performer. Uh, he would writhe around on stage, he would abuse himself, and he's also credited with inventing stage diving. Um, the Stooges' first album was produced by John Cale. Remember I mentioned that viola player that was in the Velvet Underground's first album? Uh, not to mention, the Stooges would also join the New York scene. So there was already a sort of association between what was going on in New York and what was going on in Detroit. 